Welcome back, folks, to another Rev Real Estate Live. I'm super excited for our, our guest today. We have Justin Jensen himself, and, and I don't want to jump into his experience too much right now. I'll, I'll let him do that as he introduces himself. <laughs> But super excited about today's content. One of the most important or one of the most valuable aspects of, of investing into multifamily real estate or real estate in general is the tax benefits. And so that's really what we're going to dive in today. And if you've been with us before, you know that there's no solicitation of deals on this call. That's not what these calls are for. These weekly webinars are strictly content and education so that you can make educated decisions moving forward when you're looking to passively invest. So super excited for today. As our, our process goes, again, if you're new with us, if you have a question, we ask that you just type it into the chat box. We will have a live Q&A following Justin's presentation, but a lot of times those questions come immediately and then it, your mind might move on to something else. So we encourage you to, to um, tap into the, the the chat box, write that question there. And then again, we'll, we'll have live Q&A after it. So my name is Dallin Schultz. I am the president and co-founder of Rev Equity Group. We are an investment firm focused exclusively on apartment investing. So looking forward to meeting and connecting with more of you but even more excited about having our guest on today. So without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and, and introduce Justin. Justin, appreciate you being with us today. Thanks, Dallin. I appreciate the opportunity. This is fun stuff. So uh, it's uh, I, having a CPA that can talk numbers in simple language for those of us that aren't CPAs to understand is absolutely <laughs> incredible. So Looking forward to have you on. So, Justin, why don't you just start by giving us a little bit um, about your background, your your experience, and then we'll just go from there. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, no, I do appreciate the opportunity and, and to let you know, because I'm very passionate about real estate. And, and because of that, I'm a little bit biased towards it. And we'll talk about all the reasons why. And, and the tax benefits are certainly top of the list there. Um, but just kind of a quick background. Um, as a as a graduate student, I did an internship with a real estate investment firm and I prepared tax returns. And, you know, I thought that was just the coolest thing ever. Um, and then after finishing grad school, I worked for PricewaterhouseCoopers in Seattle for four years. Uh, and when I started there, they said, oh, hey, you've done real estate. Just keep doing, let's just have you keep doing real estate. So I started in cost segregation and um, high net worth individuals investing in real estate, real estate development. It was just started this real estate snowball Four years there, the company I interned with called back and said, hey, we need a tax director. We think that you'd be the guy. You've had some good training. I stayed in touch with them anyway. So I signed on with them. And that's what got me involved in real estate investing. Because as I moved from Seattle, Washington to northern Utah, um, I turned my first home into a single family rental. That was my, that was my direct introduction to real estate. Um, but then I also, as the tax director, I got to be involved with acquisitions and was due my share of commissions and fees. Uh, and in lieu of some of those, sometimes I took equity in properties. And so 17 years later, I'm still investing with that firm. Um, I actually get the opportunity now to invest with clients also when they, when they share their um, PPMs with me and they're offering memorandums. Um, it's, so it's been, it's been, it started to snowball in the early 2000s and 20 years later, it's, it just seems to be what I do. Now, in the, in the middle of that, I, I moved from Utah to Arizona. I worked five years for Tom Wheelwright and for his firm, ProVision. He, he doesn't have ProVision anymore. It's a different firm. But while I was there, um, if somebody signed on with ProVision and said, hey, we're investing in real estate, then they would say, oh, you need to work with Justin. So it just kind of snowballed. And then now with Morrison Clark and Company, we are a, a construction and real estate accounting firm. That is our specialty. We really only work with clients in real estate. Um, and, it, you know, we, we get referrals sometimes where someone will say, hey, we hear good things about you. We're starting a bakery or some other business, but we want to strategize, tax strategize with you. Um, I might get them started, but then refer them to somebody else because it's just not our niche. We do real estate. So. I don't know if that was too much or not enough, but uh, that's a little bit about me. And, and like I say, I personally invest in real estate and, and so definitely firsthand understand the benefits of investing in real estate. 
I think that's huge. And, and the fact that there's, well, correct me if I'm wrong, Justin, but when you say you're a CPA, that's like somebody saying they're a doctor, right? It's like, well, okay, what, what kind of, well, well, in, in regards, well, I think CPAs, oh, they're, I got they're, you. they're equally I'll important, right? But what I'm saying is like, when they say they're a doctor, it's like, okay, what field, what's your specialty, what's your profession, right? Gotcha. So yeah. when you say you're a CPA, okay, CPA for, for what, right? There's, mm-hmm. there's a lot of different avenues that you could go down. And so the fact that you've specialized in real estate and not only specialized in real estate, but you yourself are passively invested in real estate. So not only do you know the business from a CPA standpoint, but you also know it as an investor. So I could only imagine how much more value that brings to you and your clients. So, uh, you know, I agree. And I, and I love being involved to that extent because a lot of times when, when clients have issues that to them are, are very unique. In most cases, I've seen it before or I've experienced it before. Or I've had other clients have done it before, you know, so it's, I, I like being in that niche. Excellent. Well, let's, let's get into it. Let's get into yeah. the, the, the nitty gritty. <clears throat> and uh, before we, we started recording, as soon as you jumped on, I, I asked that we, we talk a little bit about what it means to be a real estate professional, what it means to not be a real estate professional and the different tax benefits of that, that allocation, if you can or cannot select it on your tax return. Oh, this, those are all great, uh, great questions, great things to talk about. I think that uh, um, can kind of illustrate an example that will build up to that because certainly the, the tax benefits of investing in real estate are, for lack of a better description, real estate just by virtue of the, of the tax benefits is essentially a tax shelter. Because if you think about it, um, it's depreciation expense that is the tax shelter because depreciation expense being a non-cash deduction. If I have a rental property that's spitting off, and I'll just use a simplified example. If you're doing something bigger, you can add zeros, you can make bigger numbers, but just to illustrate a simple example, maybe you buy a $100,000 house and, and uh, you put 20 grand down to, to buy it and it's spitting out five grand a year. Um, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty, or it's a, yeah, spending 5,000 in cash a year. But if you're depreciating $5,000 a year, that's $5,000 of cash that you're putting in your pocket. So that's better than like a 401k contribution or some other tax deferred investment, because that where it's sheltered by depreciation is taxed never. It's not even tax deferred. It's just completely sheltered. I tell the story a lot. Um, and, and maybe some of you have heard me speak before or heard me say it before, but a couple of years ago when it came out in the news that Donald Trump had only paid $750 in taxes, um, I, I was like, well, yeah, that's pretty, pretty understandable. But I got approached people asking me, Justin, you're a CPA, you do real estate. Is that fair? How can that be? Is that fair? And I would say, no, I don't think it's fair at all. I think it's terrible. He, he paid way too much. We, he should have paid zero. <laughs> Should, there's no reason for him to have paid $750 in taxes. And, and we can talk about um, that later on if you want to, but because I, I don't mean to get uh, certainly not political, but not preachy or anything. But um, you know, what people need to understand is it's not like he sat on a million dollars or millions of dollars and didn't part with cash. He invested it. He put it into play. And, that, you know, that's a lot of the reason I have the cash flow quadrant up behind me. It's usually in my office. Some it, it comes up all the time in during um, presentations I give or discussions I have with clients. But you know, the point being that because he invested in real estate, he he parted with his cash and he was able to take advantage of these ad, um, benefits that we're going to talk about today. And and that's how he paid very little tax. That's awesome. And you know what? I think that's a good segue. And and since you brought it up, why don't we start? with the cash flow quadrant? Because I think that's some of the, the fundamentals that people need to understand that yeah, lead up to that. So you can see that okay behind me? Yeah, yep. So I like to talk about this. Um, having worked with Tom Wheelwright for so long uh, and then part of the Rich Dad Education uh, programs, that's definitely something that I bought into and, un- and, and grew to understand, but I totally am a fan and it works. It's worked for me and for, and for clients. Um, so if you're not familiar with the cash flow quadrant, we've got four quadrants, ESBI is employee, self-employed business owner and investor. Um, and I'll talk about these other percentages here later on, but, uh, the 
it's interesting the the way you're taxed is going to be greatly determined by which area you uh, earn your income so if you're an employee you're you're earning your income by performing services you get paid for those services that's an active trader business income um, so that's going to subject you to ordinary income tax rates at potentially the highest rates if you're in the highest tax bracket that's where the 40 percent comes in 37% tax bracket, you're going to be subject potentially to maybe net investment income tax or even just maybe just state tax, but you're going to be paying taxes if you're in the highest rate in this in this 40% range. So as you move from being um, an employee to being self-employed, potentially there's 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 tax benefits available to you here and you have opportunity to shelter income. The simplified example that I could give you is when the pandemic hit and everybody had to shelter in place, you had to work from home. But if you're an employee, you're working from home and you don't get to take a home office deduction. If you're self-employed and you're working from home, you do get to take home office deduction. So as you move from this quadrant to this quadrant, more of the tax code becomes available to you. The reason that tax rate goes up is because here um, you're paying self-employment tax. As an employee, you pay, you can think of your check stub, um, you see FICA and Medicare, that's 15, 15.3%, uh, you pay half as an employee, your employer pays the other half. If you're self-employed, you pay both halves. So, you know, you can get federal and state and self-employment tax, you can get up into the 60% range. As you move into the B, as a business owner, <clears throat> now think of it as uh, a business owner where you don't have to be at the business to, uh, to make it work. So, you know, a self-employed individual owns a business, and so they're technically a business owner, but in this case, it's it's uh, processes that are in place that whether you're there or not, the world's going to turn around and the, and the business is going to generate income for you. We have the opportunity to pay less in tax because now you don't have to be actively involved in it. So it's not active trader business income. Um, the, the example here that I hear a lot is you think of, um, oh, I'm blanking, Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, <laughs> I'm blanking on the name. The guy that does all the investments, um, you know, he he likes to say he actually pays less of a tax rate than his than his uh, secretary, because he's in this quadrant here. You know, as an investor, so this is where I was talking about about Donald Trump paying very little tax. Again, not getting political. I'm just using that as an example. But you think about the uh, thousands and thousands of pages of tax code. Um, there are there are a few tax there are a few pages that just say if you have income it's going to be taxable unless we say it's not you know so as an employee most of your or all of your income is taxable as you start to invest in housing energy agriculture technology now there's thousands of pages of tax code that become um, rather than saying that now your taxable your tax or your income is taxable, now you've got opportunity to identify investments that will that will reduce your taxes, and so you know that's where as we move all of our activity here, we can potentially shelter all of our income and pay very little if any taxes. So an easy way to look at it is if I'm on the left side of the quadrant, I'm trading time for money. If I don't put in the time, I don't get the money. Or if I, you know, and and, and this could be a very high net worth individual, or let's say a high wage earner, like a doctor, they, they may have high six figures, maybe even seven figures W-2 income. But if they stop working, the income stops coming in. On the, on the right side of the quadrant, these are the folks that they're trading time for uh, uh, or money for money, investing money for money, where if they stop working, it won't matter. Their money's working for them and it's gonna continue to generate money. But, that's exactly excellent. what you were thinking down or what? Yeah, 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 no, that was great. Absolutely. So one thought that I like to have to, to summarize that is not all salaries are created equally. And, and what I mean by that and, and, and where my thought process is going with that, if you have a, an attorney that's self-employed making 600,000 a year or a doctor making 600,000 mm -hmm. a year, mm -hmm. then you have an investor that's making 600,000 a year. They're two different sides of the quadrant. Exactly right. And so your your professional, your doctor, your attorney, their take home is going to be significantly less, where that investor could potentially take home that entire 600000 with Not a good CPA like you, right, Justin? 
as long well, as I have a CPA like you. No pressure, but yeah, they got to have someone <laughs> on their team. Um, but you know, along, along, along the lines of what you're saying, and, and not to get political again, but you hear all the time, well, the rich need to pay their fair share. Well, I'm here to tell you, the rich do pay their fair share. Rich meaning they're high wage earners, they, they earn a lot of income. If they earn a lot of income, they're, they're, in the, they're paying taxes in these areas. The rich pay their fair share. It's the wealthy that understand how to make investments that reduce their taxes. And they're, and they're still parting with their cash. You know, it's not like, again, using Donald Trump, it's not like he got a million or all those millions of dollars and he just got to sit on it and not pay taxes. No, he put it into housing. He pumped money into the economy. He provided jobs. He did the things that, that are provided for in the tax code that if you do those things, we can reduce your income. We can shelter your income. We can pay very little tax. You know, that's your that's your reward because your choice is either either you get to decide where to put your cash um, and that's these guys or you can pay your taxes and you can or you can just give it all to the government and let them decide what to do. I don't, I don't know. And, and we all know how good of stewards they are of, of <laughs> capital, right? I, I so. wasn't going to say anything. but <laughs> Exactly. So. Excellent. No, that was great. Thank you for going over that. So let's let's touch on the the yeah. real estate professional allocation. What what do you need to to be able to qualify for that on your tax return? And then let's get into to some of the tax benefits if you are. And then for those that aren't, what are still some of the benefits that they can reap from the from real estate investing? So as a real estate professional, to the requirement is this. We know we have to have more than 750 hours in real estate, and we know we need to spend more than 50% of our time in real estate related trades or businesses. So I, I'm going to tell you honestly that this is two things. This is misunderstood because this really is only step number one. Once we, once we accomplish real estate professional status, we have only overcome the presumption that any losses we have in real estate are passive doesn't guarantee that we get to take them. So that's step number two. Step number two is we have to show um, what's called material participation. So I'll, I'll just kind of denote it that way. So if, if we get number one and number two, then if we have a real estate investment that's generating a lot of loss, and that's um, we'll talk about how to do that through accelerating depreciation, that non-cash deduction, then we can take the loss without limitation. But if we have 750 hours in real estate and more time in, in real estate than other activities, and we don't have material participation, then we don't get to take the loss. So the, and it, it's not even as simple as saying, all I got to have is 750 hours in real estate. I, I hear a lot. Um, I have a lot of clients who are uh, students of Brad Sumrock and, uh, I know that they get good training and, and uh, good education from the real estate there. But I, a lot of times I hear is, well, I went to the seminar and the guy at the seminar said that all I have to have is 750 hours in real estate and I'm golden. Well, well that's step number one. But also all real estate hours are not created equal. And, and I should have pulled it up. But the, what qualifies as a real estate hour is very specific. It's outlined in tax code that real estate related trades or businesses are, if I can remember them, develop, redevelop, construct, reconstruct, um, um, manage the asset, rent or lease, you know, things like that. It's gotta be very specific things. Education is not one of them. Going to a networking event is not one of them. And traveling to a network event is not, those hours are not real estate hours for tax purposes. You know, it is part of your real estate business and it's furthering your real estate activities, but we can't count that as a real estate professional hour unless we can fit it neatly into one of the categories that the IRS says. These specific categories are what qualify as real estate professional hours. So, and then again, that's step number one. Once we've got the 750 and more time in real estate than any other activity, next step was we have to demonstrate that we had material participation or we still don't get to take the loss. So it's not as slam dunk as sometimes it's made out to sound like it is. Um, and, and, and I, I hate to be the, you know, the, the tax guy that just says, well, you, yeah, you're just an early tax guy. You can't do this. You can't, you're the can't man. No, I'm trying to tell you that if we know what the rules are, we can, we can abide by the rules and we can make sure that we get that deduction. Because the saying goes, if you want to change your tax, 
you have to change the facts. You know, I think we've probably all heard that before, but if we know what the rules are, we can, we can structure our fact pattern so that we can absolutely get that loss when we need it. Excellent. Can you dive in, uh, maybe share an example of what material participation would look like? Oh, yeah, great, great question. So there's, there's a list of seven things. And, and listen, um, Dallin, after the meetings over, because um, I talk about this a lot, there was, it's been a couple of years already, I came out of a, a presentation where for about two hours, all we did was talk about real estate professional. And it was just one question after another, it turned into a to a kind of a, a mind blown kind of thing. And so what I said to the group was, so I tell you what folks, if you'll give me your addresses, I will email you a summary of all this stuff. So it turned into an email that later now has turned into a, a handout that I give and I'll give it to you and we, we can share it with anybody who wants it. But the, the easiest way to demonstrate, well, I wouldn't say it's easiest, but the clearest way to uh, demonstrate material participation is we're gonna spend 500 hours in that activity. Now understand this, this is where it gets difficult. If I have five rental properties and I have 750 hours and I have more than 50% of my time in real estate and I've qualified for real estate professional status and I've got five real estate um, investments, two of which I have material participation and, and the other three I do not, I can deduct the loss in the two and not the loss in the other three. Now, there's, we'll talk more about that because there's something that we can do to combat that. But the, the, there are seven tests to establish material participation. The easiest one, the most I identifiable one is 500 hours. But I understand that means we have to spend 500 hours in each of our real estate investments to get, it's, this is a per activity test. We have to have that, right? Another one though is 100 hours and more time than anybody else. Um, I don't know how to denote that, but if you spend 100 hours on that investment, maybe as a GP, um, as long as you spend as much time as anybody else, uh, you know, your fellow GPs or, or even a property manager or anything like that, as long as you're spending 100 hours and as much or more time as anybody else, then you don't have to have 500, you can do this and you can still qualify as material participation. Um, there, there's some other tests too, but these are the ones that are the easiest to identify with and probably the most applicable to um, you know, to real estate clients, real estate investors, that uh, they're going to be the easiest ones to do. So before I mentioned that it has to be 500 hours per investment. If I have five investments and I only have, or, um, I only have material participation in two, I don't get to deduct losses in the other three. But the, the thing that, we, that we'd like to do is we like to do what's called, this is provided for in the tax code, we like to do a grouping election. So now I've got those same five real estate investments, but if I make an election and it is a formal election that you make on your tax return, if I make the election to group those as one activity, then I only have to hit this test once, not, not separately for each investment. That makes sense. So, um, but does that answer your question or did you? Yes, no, that, that was excellent. So let's talk about the, so what? Why, why would somebody want to be a real estate professional? What, what benefit would that provide them as they're actively investing in real estate? No, that's a really good question. Um, and, and that's where it gets really fun, I think, because if we're going back to this cash flow quadrant stuff, this is where we want to be, where we can, uh, um, we can make those investments that, uh, that allow us to take advantage of the tax code and, and pay less tax. So... All right, that's not working as well as I'd hoped it would, but uh, <laughs> maybe I should have just left it. Let me uh, get caught up here quick. But some of the benefits of real estate investment stat or real estate professional status would one would be you get to take losses without limitation. So the the most common example that I've seen recently, especially in the in the Phoenix market with my local clients, and I have clients all over the country, but Phoenix has been on fire lately, as many of you know. Um, it, it slowed down a little bit, but man, it was sure nice to, to make an investment in real estate and uh, say, maybe you do a $100,000 investment on a, on a syndication and uh, you get your K-1 for the first year and you have a $100,000 loss. It's almost like from a tax perspective, you've recouped your investment because you got that tax benefit. 
Um, <clears throat> if you're a real estate professional, you'll get to take that loss all up, all in all in one year, all up front. If you're not a real estate professional, and this is near and dear to my heart because I spend so much time in my practice as a CPA that I am not a real estate professional <laughs> and I will not ever qualify as a real estate professional until one day I decide to retire from being a CPA, but that will not likely happen. So I like to tell people I'll work until noon on the day of my funeral. So, um, and that's only if I can get the rest of the day off. But uh, um, the, the other benefit of being a real estate professional, even if you have no loss, is that we have something called net investment income tax that's in the tax code that, that adds 3.9% of tax onto your, to your income for investments. And that's if you're a high net worth. If, if you're over $250,000 of adjusted gross income and, and uh, um, you have some other investments that are, that are giving you a nice return. So maybe you have a real estate investment and rather than a big loss deduction, maybe you're into the mature years, you're into years five or six, and, and we've, we've already taken the cream off the top with the depreciation expense. And now there's just not a lot, enough depreciation left to cover the cash flow. So now you have income. Well, if we're a real estate professional, we can avoid that net investment income tax. And right off the top, we can save 3.9% in taxes. So, um, but let's, let's talk about an example on how that really actually kind of works. Because um, with... With depreciation or with uh, real estate investing, the depreciation expense is really the 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 goal. It's it's really kind of what we're after. And so I like to use what I call the, the million dollar example. Um, so I I invest a million dollars. No, I acquire a property that, that for a million dollars. That doesn't mean I had to come up with a million out of pocket, right? This is where the other benefit of depreciation is leverage because I can, I can buy a million dollar property and, and if I've got an 80% loan to value, then I'm only coming up with 200,000, right? Um, and, and we'll talk about more about that later too, but if $200,000 investment, that's 200,000 out of pocket. What I end up with, and maybe I should represent that a little bit differently is, for two hundred thousand dollars out of pocket, I end up with a, a, mil, um, a million dollar asset that I have to allocate between land and building. Usually, twenty percent towards the land. Land doesn't wear out, doesn't depreciate. We can't take a deduction for it. So, if I allocate two hundred thousand of that of that million dollars to the land, then the other eight hundred thousand is my building. This is where this is what I get to depreciate. I can't depreciate this. So here again, I invested two hundred thousand, maybe on an eighty percent loan to value, um, which happens to be the same value as the land. That's just coincidence. But I invest two hundred thousand to acquire a million dollar property. That that uh, with the result is my eight hundred thousand uh, dollar depreciable asset. And and Dylan, I've lost track of time, so don't let me get carried away. If we need to wrap it up, or oh, no, no, you're to... you're good. We still well, we got probably another fifteen minutes and 10, 15 minutes. We'll open up for Q and A. Okay, okay, great, great. So, eight hundred thousand dollar depreciable asset. If I do nothing else, this this um, let's say this is a syndication. Well, maybe it's a syndication. We should add a zero or something or two zeros. But uh, eight hundred thousand dollar asset. This because it's residential rental, we'll say in, in real estate is going to depreciate you know, over 27 and a half years, which is going to give me about a $29,000 a year deduction. So here's where I was saying, 200,000 out of pocket gives me a million dollar property, which gives me a $200,000 piece of land I cannot depreciate and a $100,000 building that I can, which will generate $29,000 of depreciation expense. I don't have to pay for this. I'm not writing a check for this. I came out 200,000 and the rest of it's um, leveraged through the bank, right? My renters are paying rent. They're, we're using that cash to, to service the debt, but the IRS is gonna allow me to take a $29,000 and change, $29,000 a year deduction on an $800,000 depreciable asset. So that means if this rental property generates $29,000 a year in positive cash flow, it's gonna be sheltered by this $29,000 deduction. That means I get that tax-free cash. I didn't have to pay 
I didn't have to pay out of pocket for this deduction, but I get to take the cash and I get to deduct it or uh, offset it with this deduction. So there's your, you know, there's your tax shelter. Uh, what's more, the other benefit of real estate is over time, this million dollar asset is going to be a million one, a million two. It's going to appreciate in value while I get to take a depreciation expense. Depreciation expense in this example is not the opposite of appreciation. It's just what the IRS allows us to deduct over time. It, it allows us to al align the deduction or the use of the building with the income that it generates. You know, it allows us to kind of line that up so that not all at once. But then that's where we want to take advantage of bonus depreciation because with bonus depreciation, and it's going to change a little bit. We'll talk about that. But in bonus depreciation currently in 2022, we can take 100% bonus depreciation. So understand that bonus depreciation is not is not extra depreciation. It's not like bonus points in a, in a quiz or in school. It's not more than possible. It, um, so maybe it's a misnomer in that regard. But what it what it will do is if we can take some of this 800,000 and we can move it out of the 27 and a half year asset category and we put it in a five year category, a seven or 10 or 15 year category or 20, as long as it's 20 year category or less, then we can take a full 100% depreciation deduction for that. We don't have to wait for the 27 and a half years. But a lot of times what I see in a cost segregation is just for easy math here, we'll say 30%. 30% of this 800,000 um, becomes 240,000, which comes out of this 27 and a half year category. And it goes into these, we'll say five, seven, 10, 15, it goes into these categories. And this is, um, this is eligible for 100% bonus depreciation. So that means if I made a $200,000 investment to buy this million dollar property, it gave me an $800,000 building and I do a cost segregation on that building, I could potentially get a $240,000 deduction in the first year. My $200,000 investment gave me a $240,000 deduction. That's a pretty good deal, you know. And, and so before I also mentioned leverage, this is where leverage could come into play. Uh, in the example, I said 80% uh, uh, loan to value. What if it's a 90% loan to value? I, and I know that even 80 right now these days, at least what I'm seeing is 80 is pretty, pretty good. I'm seeing in some cases, I've already seen 65, but I wanted to show you how leverage can really help you because uh, if it's a 90% loan to value, now I'm only 100,000 out of pocket, but I'm still going to make this, I'm still going to buy this asset. I'm still going to make this same allocation. So my $100,000 investment could potentially give me a $240,000 deduction. That's where leverage is your friend. So, and, and I say that kind of, I know that there's different schools of thought. Even here in the office, we taught Financial Peace University. So I speak that language, but I, having worked for uh, Tom Wheelwright and been involved with Rich Dad Education, definitely speak to other people's money, the OPM language too. And I'm not telling you right or wrong, you get to decide where you want to set the dial. But um, had a lot of clients that wanted to pay cash for their um, one and two hundred thousand dollar properties until I showed them how leverage works and how much more of a re rate of return they could get, and now they're utilizing leverage. But, but again, like if I have a hundred thousand dollar investment to acquire this property, I can get a two hundred forty thousand dollar deduction. Um, in twenty twenty two, we'll talk about what's going to happen here because I can get one hundred percent bonus depreciation. So, in twenty twenty two, the bonus depreciation amount is set for one hundred percent. In 23, it's set to reduce 20% a year for the next five years until it phases out completely in 2026. And now we would no longer get 100% bonus depreciation. But understand that if I do this cost segregation to accelerate the depreciation, um, to move this chunk of the 800 into these categories, um, the, the 560 that remains will depreciate over 27 and a half years. So it will continue to depreciate. If I, I would still do this, even if I didn't get bonus depreciation, I would still accelerate it because then that means I'll get a $240,000 deduction 
um, spread out over the next few years here, rather than waiting for all of it to depreciate over 27 and a half years, I'm still accelerating the depreciation, even if I don't get bonus. So it still helps you shelter more of that cash, more of that um, income becomes tax-free if we can accelerate that depreciation. That's the tax benefit of investing in real estate. Okay. Um, unless you wanted to have a specific question here, I wanted to kind of take this to the next level. What do you think, Dylan? Yeah, let, let's open it up for a quick question. I, I know okay, that we... Um, I know that we we usually save questions to the end and, and we got about 20 minutes left. So it's it's probably about that time. But before we move on, before we move on to uh, the, the next topic, anyone have a question regarding what Justin just shared with us in regards to the depreciation? Because then we're going to take it to the next level. <laughs> so, Justin, I have a question is all of that what you just shared with us for specifically for real estate professionals or is it also for those of us that are just strictly passive can we take advantage of parts of that as a passive investor absolutely and so what i just said we're going to take it to the next level that's exactly that's what the, i was going to answer okay. with that question perfect yeah oh, wait, great question because that that's important i think that uh um I, i've seen it many times firsthand where I've been involved with a deal where um, just like this, there's a, you know, maybe you subscribe, well, let's just use this example. The $200,000 investment gives you $240,000 deduction. Well, if you're a real estate professional, you get to take that whole deduction all at once. Real estate professional with material participation. Um, and so if you're part of a, uh, of a syndication where you see all your partner or some other partners going, woohoo, we got this huge deduction. Uh, and then all of us who are just passive investors, and I say us because that's my boat, um, you know, we get to sit by and watch those guys do cartwheels and, and have all their joy and revelry and think, yeah, you big jerks. But we'll see who laughs at the end because, because Jim, that, that loss carries forward to the very end. Let's say it goes full cycle in three years and you put in, um, let's say you invest $100,000 and you got a $100,000 uh, loss in year one, you couldn't deduct because you're a passive investor. You're not a real estate professional. You don't have other sources of passive income. We can talk about those rules, but just to illustrate the point, in year three, if your share of the game is $100,000, well, guess who got to pocket $100,000 and not pay any taxes? You and I as limited partners got to do that. All those guys that got the deduction on the front end when they get their share of the gain on the back end, they better go find another investment to shelter the gain or they're going to they're gonna end up paying taxes in the back end. So not a terrible deal for them either. I mean, because they got to use their money for three years without having to pay tax. And then everyone talks about, and this is a whole other tangent. Everyone talks about, well, yeah, but what about depreciation or capture? And I just say, oh, give me a break about that. If, if Especially if you have a CPA who says, well, what do you, what do you accelerate depreciation for? You just have to pay it all back in the end. They don't understand depreciation or capture. It doesn't work that way. We can minimize the effects of depreciation or capture. Plus, if we're, if we're in these, um, um, well, I was going to say is if we're, if we're in the highest tax bracket and we're getting a 37% deduction for our depreciation expense, um, in year three, when it sells and that depreciation gets recaptured, it gets recaptured at a max rate of 25%. That 12% difference is a permanent tax saving that you will never, ever pay back. Um, it, it's not a bad deal. But Jim, does that answer your question or is that at least? Yeah, no, perfect. Thank you. And thank you for all this content too. It's, it's awesome, Justin. Appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for asking. That's a good question. And, and it was what I was building up to. So it's probably a great segue, but let's see if there's anything else that comes in. I have a, a question. Um, it's me, Jose. And um, Jose. Yeah. hey, how you doing, Justin? <laughs> we met. <laughs> we had to do breakfast burritos, but uh, <laughs> um, it's good to see you, so, man. Hey, okay. it's good seeing you too. I appreciate the content too. Um, so right now with interest rates being so high, um, it, it seems like on the surface, it's a wash to either um, to, to, to leverage other people's money at, at 7% or just pay my investors back and, and raise the whole thing at 7%. But as, after watching what you're talking about, since there are some sort of hidden tax benefits to leveraging other people's money, is there a, it seems like there might be an advantage say I have a $2 million asset to um, only raise 40% of it, lever and then get a mortgage for the other 60%. 
because there might be some tax benefits as opposed to just raising the entire $2 million um, and then paying my investors back instead of paying the bank interest? Yeah, that's a great question. Because before I said that even out of this office, um, we taught Financial Peace University. So I have clients who are like, there's no such thing as good debt. There's only bad debt and they won't touch debt. Um, and, and that's for them to decide. Everybody's got a different criteria, a different strategy. Uh, my job is to make it work for them tax-wise, you know, get the most that we can out of it tax-wise. But when we utilize leverage here, just like I was saying, um, if I buy if I buy this million dollar property for a two hundred thousand dollar down payment on an eighty percent loan to value, um, I could potentially come out with a two hundred forty thousand dollar deduction. And the good I mean the good news of that is ostensibly then the other eight hundred thousand is being financed. That's being paid for by the renters, and uh, that's not coming out of pocket for you. That's using the other people's money. The other thing I hear a lot is, and I don't mean to tangent, Jose. I think maybe I lost track of your question. But the other thing of that, and I wanted to make that point is that the other thing I hear a lot is, well, gosh, that's so risky. Um, you know, what if it goes bad? Well, whose money is at risk here? If I put 200,000 of my own to buy a million dollar property, then bank puts up the other 800,000, whose money is at risk? Not yours. It's the bank's money is at risk. And if, if the renters don't pay and you're not able to service the debt, what are they gonna do? They're gonna take the building back. So what are you out? you're out, you're $200,000. Um, and I know I'm oversimplifying. It can be a whole lot st um, stickier than that, messier than that. But that's just to kind of illustrate that point. But but Jose, I'm sorry I tangented. Did that even come close to answering your question? Or was that the point you were making? I think the question was basically, um, is there a tax advantage to raising the whole million dollars as opposed to uh, leveraging 80% of it? Okay. Okay. That's where I tangented. That's a great question because I bought the million dollar property for $200,000, right? And it gave me a, a $240,000 deduction in this example. If I bought, if I got 90% loan to value, I did it for a hundred thousand dollars. I still get the $240,000 deductible. So your question is, well, what if I raise the entire million and I just pay cash and there's no leverage? I still only get a $240,000 deduction in year one. It's the same outcome. So that's where you get to set the dial. How much of other people's money do you want to use or how much of your own do you want to use? But you're still only going to get 240, in this example, you're still only going to get $240,000 of benefit from taxes. Perfect. Thank you. That, that helps a lot. Gotcha. Good question. So I, and I don't mean to be biased, but yeah, I'm all about other people's money. <laughs> so I, I, I think it's safe to say we all are, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> That's why this is always up in my office somewhere. We're always talking about other people's money. So, <laughs> um, but so Dallin, I don't know how we're doing on time. Um, I, I, I kind of wanted to build off of Jim's question earlier. Did, what are your thoughts? Yeah, let's let's go for it. We got it. Okay. We got just under. We got about thirteen minutes. Okay. Okay. Oh, we should have plenty of time then. And uh, it's it's nice to have this whiteboard wall, but. Uh, I need better markers or something that, that like the ink dries and it doesn't wipe off as easy as it should. So let's do this. So keep your keep your finger on that page where we talked about that um, million dollar example with the two hundred thousand dollar investment and a two hundred forty thousand dollar deduction in year one through cost segregation and bonus depreciation, right? So okay, so here's our here's our year one. $240,000 deduction. If I'm, a, if I'm a real estate professional in year one, we'll say, uh, we'll say year one, I get a $240,000 deduction. Now, this assumes you met all the requirements for real estate professional and you met the material participation test. Remember, it's a two part thing. We can't forget this part number two, it's two steps rather. But if I'm just a passive investor in the same indication or same syndication, um, and I have no other source of passive income, then I don't get any deduction that year. But um, but it rolls forward to the next year, and it's it rolls forward indefinitely until the day comes that I either do generate passive income, or we sell the property. Once the property sells, then anything I couldn't deduct in year one. Um, becomes immediately deductible in full without limitation 
in the year that it sells. So, um, and, and there's some complications to that with when, it, when I mentioned the grouping election. If you take all of, remember I said, if you had five, uh, five real estate investments and you grouped it all in one group, well, if you sell one of the properties that has passive losses, then maybe we shouldn't have made the grouping election. There's some nuances to that where because you actually won't be able to deduct that until you sell all of the assets in the group. So we can go into that later. But for the purposes of this illustration and to kind of build off what Jim was asking, um, $240,000 deduction gets reported to you in a K-1 in year one. If you're a real estate professional with material participation, you'll get a $240,000 deduction. If you're a limited partner without any other source of passive income to offset that 240, then you get nothing. It gets suspended. It gets rolled forward, right? So then let's say in year two- But just to clarify real quick, Justin, you don't lose it. Right. You just That's can't take it in that first correct. year. And I should have been more, more clear about that because that's exactly what I meant by it rolls forward. It'll just continue to roll forward indefinitely. It never expires. It rolls forward until you either generate passive income. Um, you know, maybe you've got um, this, this investment in year one and then um, you've got two or three others that, that they already took the top off with uh, depreciation expense and, and now they're showing income. Well, if I had another investment that was showing income and I'm a passive investor, if I have another investment that's showing income and this investment is showing the loss, that income would be offset by this loss. So you never lose it. It's going to roll forward indefinitely. If I had no other investments, then yeah, I get nothing. But I get nothing in, in that year. It will roll forward indefinitely until some point in the future when I do generate passive income or I sell the property, right? So well, let's go to year two here, or does that answer your question, Dallin? Yeah, no, that was excellent. Thank you. Okay. In year two, um, let's say we sell this property and, uh, um, well, I'm going to make it, I'm going to oversimplify this, but I want to illustrate the point. Let's say this property just appreciated in value, it shot through the moon. And, you know, actually in the local market, the Phoenix market here in the last two years, I've seen some three X multiples with some of my clients. So that's a, not a bad deal. It's uh, been pretty good, but let's say in year two, um, this real estate professional has, they sell this property and has, to, um, <clears throat> we'll say 200,000 of gain on uh, is, is his or her share of the gain on the sale of the property. Well, um, let's say they get the loss here. In year two, they're going to have to pay taxes on this gain and not have any loss to offset that with. Um, for the limited partner in year two, if their share of the gain is 200,000, um, they had 240 off to the side here that wasn't used before, that now their taxable gain is zero. And, uh, and I know this doesn't add, look correctly, but uh, what will end up happening is here, since they took that deduction in year one, they're going to have $200,000 gain in year two in this example. And I, I understand this is an oversimplification. I just want to show the mechanics on how this works because the real estate professional got this deduction on the front. They get nothing on the back. So if their share of the gain is 200,000, this is what I was saying before, they better go find another property so that they can shelter that income. Um, that starts what we call uh, a positive addiction. Now you're on the hamster wheel. Now every year you got to go find something else or, uh, or, or, you know, the, the taxes are going to come due. Um, so for this guy, and, and this is a, for, you mentioned, Jim, that you're a limited partner. So am I. So we're in the same boat. What's nice about this is here's $240,000 of loss that I couldn't take in year one. In year two, my share of the gain was $200,000. So in fact, I probably represented this wrong. Not only do I show no taxable income, um, but I have an additional $40,000 of loss here that uh, I didn't get to use in year one that now I can deduct in year two without limitation. So if the only other income I had besides the gain on the share, uh, my share of the gain on the sale of the building was a couple hundred thousand dollars on a W-2, this would offset my W-2, even though I'm not a passive, I mean, I'm not a real estate professional. When this property sells, if you're a limited partner, if you have unused loss and that loss exceeds that your share of the gain, 
you get to take the rest of that loss without limitation. It will offset your W-2, you get a big fat refund. That is incredible. And I've never actually heard that before, Justin. I was always under the impression that you had to be a real estate professional to deduct anything from your W-2 income. But in the situation, you're saying, no, you don't need to be. As long as that loss is significantly or higher than that gain, then Correct. whatever that delta is, that difference, it doesn't matter what you subtract that from. Yeah, it's it's yours. Um, and, and that's only when you sell it. So what you were saying before where you couldn't take it against W-2 income, that's true um, in year one, year two, you know, maybe as you go along. And, and sometimes that, that gets lost because like I said, if I have another investment, if I have another investment that had $40,000 of income in this, in this first year, then I'm not carrying forward 240, I'm only carrying 200 because I'll use portion of this to offset my other investment. In year two then, in that same scenario, if the property sells and I get $200,000 gain coming my way, then it's gonna offset dollar for dollar and I'll have nothing left over. But, but, but I like how you describe that. If, if my loss, exceed, or if my unused passive loss, suspended carryover exceeds my share of the gain, and that property sells, and I'm a limited partner, I don't have to be a real estate professional to take the remaining 40,000 and then we'll offset. I'll take it without limitation. That's incredible. We had another question come up. What if the, the group decided to refinance it versus selling it? Does that change anything in this scenario? Um, um, no, that's a good question. Because where it's debt, debt is not income. So any cash you pull out of a refinance is not taxable. So that's good news. But my basis in that property, I erased it all, still remains a million dollars. You know, it's in this example, it was a million dollar property. Uh, maybe it went up to 1.2 million and you, you decided to, to take a um, cash out refinance of 200,000 um, or three, if you'd paid down the loan to 900,000. Um, but you see my point is that, so it's not income to pull out that, that cash, but your basis in the property remains the same. Unless you take some of that equity and improve the build, the property, that becomes depreciable basis. Then we can, we can start depreciation over there. But other than that, it's not going to change your tax situation. It's not going to change your position. Excellent. Good awesome question. stuff. Mike, you got a question? Yep, got a quick question. Hey, Justin, I'm glad your voice is back. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> I had a meeting with Michael and I was a little sick last week. And I think I was talking like this because I didn't. <laughs> I made him I talk a lot too. At all. <laughs> hey, just so, on the um, recapture side of that, how would that play into this? And would that negative 40 be allowable to offset any recapture tax or carry it over depreciation from other properties? Can that offset recaptured tax? Good question. Yes, this would be deducted. Um, without limitation, so it offset everything. Um, but does that answer your question? Is that where you? Yeah. Were well, asking? and even if it couldn't, say you didn't have any left over from that two forty, can depreciation that's been being carried over from other investments uh, as a passive investment offset any of that? Say that twenty five percent worst case recapture. Yeah, um, that's a really good question, and the, the the answer is yes, and that gets missed a lot, and and with with new clients a lot, and and you know, Mike, I can't remember the specifics of your situation and, and we won't share any specifics anyway, but um, with, with new clients, I always review their prior year tax returns. And this is why, because that, that passive loss to carry forward, this gets missed a lot by other CPAs. They think, well, um, and, and what, I mean, what I mean by that is this, they think, well, if that property sells, then, and you've held it for more than a year, well, that's capital gain the gain's going to get taxed at 20%, right? And that's where the IRS says, hey, no deal. You took a deduction at ordinary rates. We're not going to let you pay taxes now at, at capital gain rates. We're going to have to find a happy medium. And that's where the 25% came in on depreciation recapture rates, which is still a good deal. But uh, what gets missed is that if I simplify it, I would say um, real estate is passive by nature. So that means income is passive and losses are passive. Passive losses can only be used to offset other sources of passive income. Well, the definition of passive income in section 469 of the Internal Revenue Code says that passive income includes the gain on the sale of property from a passive activity. So if I sell my property at a gain, 
it's and I have no way to offset that gain. It is taxed that capital gain rates. It's a capital gain, but it is sale. Or it is an asset that's sold in a passive activity, which means that is also passive income. Which means this law, uh, this gain would be offset by um, an other. Say if I had another uh, investment off to the side where um, they did cost segregation and you've got a big chunk of loss coming your way in year one, that passive loss would offset this passive gain, even though it's taxed at capital rates, it's passive because it was an asset that was sold as part of a passive activity. So does that answer your question? Do you see where yeah. I'm going with that? Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Great question. Because I'm going to tell you that gets missed a lot. Uh, I'll look at a tax return and say, no, 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 no. This is not capital it's not pure portfolio income it was an asset from a passive activity which makes it by definition in the tax code um, part of your passive gain which would be offset by your passive loss even if it's from an other building or you know another investment so i guess missed a lot well, thanks good question uh, excellent question Mike, appreciate you asking that. All right, we got one more that somebody threw in the chat box, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. Question is, if your investments are under an LLC, can you still use these tax breaks against your W two income? Yes, the uh, I mean, and that's just a quick answer. I simplify, especially if the LLC is owned by you um, as a single member of the LLC. Um, I mean, everything that we're talking about. I, I could talk into next week about all this stuff. It gets has gone on and on and on. But the quick answer to the question there is that yeah, that changing or having that entity in place does not change the tax treatment or the nature <clears throat> of the tax benefits. It still flows through to you as though that entity didn't even exist and it still gets treated the same way. It doesn't lose its character. Excellent. Yes, thank thank you. All right, folks. Uh, Justin, thank you so much, man. This was this. I, every time I start talking about taxes with somebody that really knows taxes and real estate, I learn something new and it's absolutely incredible. And I start realizing how much I don't know. And I'm sure we all feel that way as well. <laughs> so if there's anything you could take away from the webinar with Justin today, you've got to get yourself a real estate centered CPA because there are so many aspects and nuances that with their experience, they're going to pick up on. And Justin, I shared this with some people previously, but you probably never heard it um, from, from us or anyone on my team. But my very first CPA five years back as I was getting started came to me and said, guys, taxes is just an expense of, of doing business. So you just nope. need to accept we're it that way. <laughs> and we're like, you're not our CPA. Yeah, exactly right. So it, uh, the thing to keep in mind with CPAs is that it's not always what your CPA charges you. It, it can become more of, an, uh, of a function of what they cost you. Because here I mentioned that I catch these, these errors sometimes. And I think, man, that ended up costing this client tens of thousands, if not more, in tax that they did not need to pay when they could have paid a two or $3,000 tax bill. And you might think, oh, that's an expensive tax return. Well, it's not if the alternative is to pay a $90,000, $100,000 tax bill because it just something was missed, you know, so, but I'm glad you said that story down. That was good. Uh, a good CPA is 100% an investment, right? And if we're in the world of investing, whether we're actively or passively, you're doing yourself and your investors a major disservice by not having a good CPA on board. Justin, what would be the best way for people to get a hold of you? Oh, great question. Um, can always go to our website at morrisonclarkcompany.com. And there's no E in Clark. It's just morrisonclarkcompany.com. Um, or you can email me. And I don't know. Maybe that's not the best way to do it. I get bombarded with emails and I have to have help. But my direct email address is my first initial last name, J Jensen, with an E-N, and then the same domain, at morrisonclarkcompany.com. And... Uh, um, Gosh, I, I have, there's a link to, uh, I have a Calendly app. My assistant set that, up, set that up for me because I was getting bombarded with appointment requests. Um, you can always, you can always click that. One of the options there is a, is a, um, a, um, is a free initial consultation for 30 minutes. You know, let's talk about what you got going on. If there's a, if it's a good fit for us and how we can work together going forward. But 
But even at that, I just love talking about this stuff. And I was admitting to Dallin, as I mentioned to you earlier, before we started that uh, um, one of the things that I hear a lot when I, when I do pick up a new client is, man, I wish I'd have known you five years ago. I wish I'd have known you 10 years ago. Um, so so even, if, even if nothing else, I want to make sure you point it in the right direction so that you don't make some of those expensive, costly mistakes that are expensive and costly to fix in the long run, so. Oh, did I lose you? Looks like Dallin's kind of frozen up there for a moment. Yep. And we lost him. <laughs> <laughs> well, Justin, I'll... Uh, Oh, he's coming back. There he is. Hey, sorry, guys. My, uh, oh, my yes. computer just all of a sudden died. So, uh, <laughs> so um, but excellent. So I want we want to be respectful to your time, Justin. So no, why no. don't you email Paul and I your Calendly link, and we can provide that to the group. That way they can schedule calls when, when you're available and, and stick to that process. We greatly appreciate it this this information it's it's extremely valuable and, and we're super excited to have you on so we're gonna have to get you out to one of our live events That'd be I'd be great. i love that stuff so <laughs> yeah no i appreciate it this has been great for me too i appreciate the opportunity and i always happy to talk about taxes um and maybe paul could could attest to this but uh, the, the only other thing that I can't stop talking about is barbecue. I used to do competition barbecue. I was a certified barbecue judge. So in, anytime anyone wants to have a barbecue lunch, I'll meet you. I'll, I'll meet you at a couple of places I recommend and, and uh, don't say, well, I better not say out loud. <laughs> but uh, I, I'd be happy to have lunch with anybody anytime. It'd be full of fun. Awesome. That, that's a huge gold nugget there. It's hard to get CPAs out of their offices, guys, but there you go. He just, he just dropped it for us. So, folks, thank you so much for coming out to another Rev Real Estate Live webinar. As you can see, this is all content and education. So if you've appreciated what you've, what you've heard, what you've seen today, we're, we're looking to expand this. We want people to know that there's other options out there and oftentimes better options when it comes to investments. And this is just one of the many reasons why we as a team focus exclusively on multifamily real estate. So we appreciate you all coming out again, Justin, thank you so much. And uh, folks, we'll, we'll hopefully see you next week. Have a great week, everyone. Oh, thanks again. Thank you. That was great. Thank you.